You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Welcome to MD for Moms with your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. Traditional psychiatry, integrative medicine, or just someone to talk to, Dr. Carly is here to provide moms with personal solutions so that they may experience whole body, mind, and well being at this most extraordinary time of motherhood. Now, please welcome the host of MD for Moms, Dr. Carly Snyder. Welcome. You are listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. I'm a reproductive and perinatal psychiatrist, meaning I work with women struggling with emotional symptoms throughout their reproductive years. I am also mom to three kids of my own. This show, MD for Moms, is dedicated to helping women enjoy life more, to maximizing health and wellness, and to improving women's relationships with themselves and with others. So I'm going to remind you throughout the show, you can call in and ask us questions directly on air. The number is 866 866- Four five one, one four five one. Take advantage and give us a call. We would love to hear from you. So we are continuing our series, Mama Docs on Call, where I'm introducing you to physicians who are also moms, who are here to provide information and support that's really geared to you and your family. And our topic today impacts really all women. Um, that's our breasts, you know, and it's not just our breasts per se, but it's really those bumps, the lumps, the various fluids, everything that comes out of our breasts. And frankly, I think the first thing that pops in our head is cancer, right? It's malignancy. It, it's, it causes like anxiety beyond belief, but we are not talking about cancer today. We're not talking about malignancy because not all lumps are malignancies. No, and not all breast pain means malignancy. In fact, I think Rarely, but we're going to get there. My guest today is going to tell us why there are a lot of things that can cause breast pain and lumps and, you know, discharge, all this stuff. And it doesn't mean you have cancer. It can mean a lot of things. So we're going to learn a lot. So Dr. Sangeeta Kalori, she's a fellowship trained breast surgeon. She's practicing in San Antonio and she's going to tell us so much about these issues and more. Welcome. How are you doing? I'm good. So can you explain what you do? Yes, ma'am. So uh, I am a dedicated breast surgeon, which means I do breast surgery 100% of the time. I don't focus on anything else besides the breast, which I'll start by saying, if you ever have the need of a surgeon for your breast, um, that's the kind of person that you want as someone who does it 100% of the time. Um, and what I do is I see, obviously, breast cancer patients and treat them surgically, but I also see a wide variety of uh, benign breast disease and, and complaints. One of the most common complaints that I see is breast pain, and we call that nostalgia. And it's, you know, very shocking to patients just how much, um, how common this is and how frustrating that can be. And it often drives what they want should they down the road happen to be diagnosed with breast cancer, even if it's completely unrelated. And it's a real shame because there's so much we can do to address breast pain. Nobody has to live with that kind of discomfort. And there's a lot of things that we can talk about what to do. Now, when we say breast pain, in my head, right, the first thing that comes to mind was when I had my first son, when my first child, my only son, I remember having mastitis. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. Um, All of a sudden, it was like red, throbbing, you know, bulge and Mm -hmm. pain. Really incredibly, like, painful, 
you know, like knives in my one side, right? So is this what we're talking about or are we talking about something else or is there a variety of what can be considered or what is common um, when it comes to pain for women? So that's an excellent question. Um, So we usually divide between patients who are lactating, and by the way, I am too because I'm on maternity leave. Um, yes, congratulations. Not. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so I, I believe me, that topic strikes very close to home right now. But um, mastitis as related to lactation and even just breast pain as related to lactation is its own category because you're talking about very hormonally active tissue that is creating milk. It has exposure to the normal um, bacteria that exists on your skin as well as in the baby's mouth. And that creates Um, an opening for bacteria to get in and cause an infection, uh, especially because milk is so nutritious. Um, So that is uh, lactational mastitis, and that's a whole separate topic, so we won't get into that too much, um, except to say that if you develop mastitis, you probably should see your doctor and start a course of antibiotics uh, because that infection can get serious very quickly. But the vast majority of patients, when they're having breast pain, what they mean is day-to-day breast pain that just doesn't relent. It's sometimes worse at night. Oftentimes, patients blame the bra, and we'll get into why that's incorrect. Um, we see patients who that pain gets worse with their cycle. Uh, sometimes it gets worse as they're stepping into menopause. Uh, and what this usually leads to is, you know, patients are hesitant to go for mammograms because they have discomfort. They're hesitant to hug people. They have trouble sleeping at night because they can't sleep on their belly or on their side because it's just uncomfortable. And then it leads to a generalized state of fear that this could mean something worse like cancer. And none of these things have to be the case. Um, So how we manage breast pain, first of all, um, when the patient comes in, I do a breast exam. And by the way, everyone should be getting a breast exam once a year by their doctor just to make sure that there is no other contributing factor, nothing nothing else to, to point to. And assuming that that's otherwise negative, the first thing I do is I have the patient put their bra back on. 90% of women are wearing the wrong size, 90%. And usually I ask patients, where is this pain located? And almost always they say, well, it hurts on the sides, it hurts underneath. Uh, When I wear an underwire bra, it really pinches. And their solution is often Not to wear an underwire bra, not to wear a bra at all, or to wear a sports bra. All of these are terrible because they actually exacerbate the pain. So what you should be looking for in a bra fitting, first of all, go to a responsible certified bra fitter. And I'm going to go out here and say something against a retailer. Dear God, do not go to Victoria's Secret to purchase a bra (laughs) that you're going to wear every day. It's perfectly fine to buy one there that you're going to take off in five minutes recreationally, if you know what I mean. But if your goal is to buy a bra that gets you through the workday, that is not the place to go because they do not know how to measure people. And 90% of the patients that walk into my office with this complaint are wearing the wrong size, and that's what they were told by Victoria's Secret. They routinely measure me as a 36E. I am a 34G. Oof, that's big difference. That's how far off they are. That's terrible. Yep, and that's pretty much everybody I see. So and part of the reason is that they don't stock certain sizes and they don't really know what they're doing. And also the bras are just poorly constructed. So in my opinion, it's like taking your money and throwing it in the garbage. But um, I recommend uh, Dillard's or Nordstrom's or, um, or a certified uh, shop like that. And there's a couple of things that you want to look for. First of all, when you wear your bra, before you even put it on, Take a look in the mirror and figure out which breast is the bigger one. Because there's always one. They're not twins. They're, they're neighbors. Okay? So figure out which is your bigger breast. That is the breast that you must fit the bra to. Okay? And if the other side is a little bit too loose, then you add padding and stuff like that. So you always want to fit to the bigger one because otherwise your bra will never fit correctly because it's always too small for that side. So you start with the one that you think is bigger. So then what you're going to do is you're going to go to the certified bra fitter and that person is going to measure you. That measurement is not the size. That's just the jumping off point. Okay? So then you've got to look and see how does your breast fit in that cup? Okay? 
if you're anything bigger than a B cup, you should be wearing an underwire. And this is where patients argue with me saying, no, 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 the underwire pinches. If your underwire is pinching you, that's contributing to your breast pain, and that's because it's the wrong size. Your underwire hmm. should never pinch. If you lift your arm up all the way to the sky and you draw a line from your armpit going straight down the side of your chest, that is where your underwire should go all the way out to. And most patients, when I show them that, the underwire is actually on their breast tissue. Uh, what patients don't realize is the breast actually extends all the way out to what we call the mid-axillary line which is that line that I talked about. You draw a line straight down from your armpit, and that's where your breast ends. So your underwire has to reach all the way out to there, way out to the side. And I guarantee if that's where your wire is sitting, it will not pinch because there is no breast tissue to pinch there. That's where it has to fit. So that's step one, okay? Now, step two is when patients are wearing the wrong size, they usually pick a cup size that's too small, and then to make it work, they pick a band size, which is the number, that is too big. And then their shoulders are struggling, then they're hiking up the straps, and the telltale sign is you get these marks on the shoulders. If you have marks on your shoulders, you're wearing the wrong size. So start with that cup size. And you may, when they measure you, remember, like I said, that's just a starting off point. Look and see if that wire reaches all the way out to the side, and if it doesn't, you go one size up, okay? Additionally, in the center of your breast, between your two breasts where your cleavage is located, those wires should sit flat to your chest wall. There should be no gap. You should not be able to put a tube of lipstick in there, <laughs> okay? And if, that's, if it's pushed into your chest and you're noticing what I call the double boob effect, which is your breast doesn't fit inside the cup and you kind of see one boob and then a second boob, then again, this cup is too small. Go one size up, okay? Most women have larger breasts than what they think, and they are skinnier than they think, which is good news for everybody. <laughs> so yeah. that's what you want to aim for. That's what you want to aim for. And I recommend, uh, unfortunately, good bras of quality are expensive. But one good bra, I swear, is worth 10 bad ones. So take those old bras. Um, if you have um, a, a donation place nearby, take your old bras. Don't even get tempted to save them. I know they were expensive, but donate them because there are other women who really could use those, like in domestic violence shelters. So donate those, and that way you don't feel bad about the wasted money. And then go out and get yourself measured. And I recommend getting measured once a year because, let's face it, the breasts that you start with when you're 15 are not the ones you retire <laughs> with at 75. Am I right? That's so sadly true, unless you augment them, which, you know, mm -hmm. you know, some I mean, of us do. The size changes. That and is true, said, I'm lactating right now, so, like, I'm very much in the middle of this. And, you know, and it, it, it is a struggle to, you know, it always feels like a moving target, but that's why you stay on top of it and you keep getting measured, and your size will change and evolve over the years. Now, so that's the fitting, and that's oftentimes a big contributing factor. Other contributing factors for patients uh, include uh, caffeine intake. A lot of patients are very sensitive to caffeine. So coffee, tea, sweet tea, chocolates, all that stuff. If you're having uh, a struggle with breast pain, try decreasing that caffeine intake, including green tea, all that stuff, and see if that helps you out. Uh, another thing is try, uh, when you're having pain, try ibuprofen, which is Motrin or Advil, uh, as needed to help you with the breast pain, and that should help you out a little bit. But obviously, that's not a good long-term solution. So one supplement that has been shown to help about 60% of women with their breast pain is called evening primrose oil, and you can take it once or twice a day. But remember, it's just a supplement. So if you take it on a Monday, it's not going to work on a Tuesday. Usually you have to take it for at least one to three months every day consistently before you see any kind of difference. And no one thing that I'm recommending is going to be the silver bullet that fixes this problem for a patient. You got to kind of try them all and be patient and take your time and, and it will help you in the long run. Um, additionally, other things that you can try, um, uh, warm packs and cold packs. Some people try vitamin E and that's also helpful. Um, and iodorol is another supplement that can be helpful. But between, generally speaking, between bra fitting, caffeine intake, and evening primrose oil, those are the really helpful tools. 
That's awesome. Well, we have to take a brief break. You're listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Slander, and we are getting a crazy amount of awesome information from Dr. Sangeeta Kalori about breast pain, and we're going to get so much more, so don't go away. The earliest human societies worshipped a female goddess. Little is known about this time because we did not always have a written recorded history. It was around 3100 BC when the Sumerians invented the first written language and everything that preceded this time is prehistory. The prehistorical record includes all of women's unwritten history from 30,000 B.C. to the time that men began achieving political power around 3000 B.C. Male feminist artist Kimberly Berg maintains a strong position in educating and inspiring both men and women through his devotional art to the goddess in all women. Studying their history is paramount to understanding who women were and who they would become later living in a patriarchal society. To learn more about this important time in our history, go to www.isisrising.net. Do you battle with weight loss? There is a solution. Founder of Weight No More Consulting, Deborah Simons, can help you lose weight safely and effectively through weight loss surgery. I know. I had the surgery two years ago, and I am 135 pounds lighter and medication-free. This full-service weight loss center caters to your every need as you navigate to a healthy weight following surgery. Servicing all of Canada, Weight No More Consulting takes pride in its compassionate care and guides you through each step before and after surgery. Starting with informational meetings, Weight No More Consulting educates each potential client before they decide to have surgery on the health risks of obesity and the various weight loss surgeries available. After surgery, Weight No More Consulting provides a solid support system with ongoing meetings to ensure continued success. Deborah Simons and Weight No More Consulting are committed to promoting your health and wellness through maintaining a healthy weight for life. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center, and we are talking about breasts, which is just, frankly, a great subject. It is. I can't help it. It's a great subject with fellowship trained breast surgeon, Dr. Sangeeta Kalori. And if you have a question, call us. Our phone lines are open 866-451-1451. Listen, I have questions. I I was just peppering her with questions in the break. Um, so we were talking before about breast pain and now we're going to, you know, transition over and talk about breast masses. Now, I think it's fair to say that any of us, you know, who ha- any of us who have felt a lump, a bump, anything, right? The first thing we all do is freak out, right? It's like, oh my God, I have breast Absolutely. cancer. Because Absolutely. that is, you know, I think ingrained in our minds as being what a lump means, which is a good thing on one hand, right? Because it keeps us all on our toes and, right, you want to always rule out the worst case scenario, before yeah. anything else. Um, and the truth is, it does happen. Um, but just because you have a mass does not actually mean you have a malignancy, correct? What, what? Absolutely. Absolutely. What could and it be? What I would start by saying is 90% of biopsies performed on breast masses turn out to be benign. They don't turn out to be cancer. So that's a very reassuring number. Uh, but if you do feel a mess, you absolutely should go see a breast surgeon and get that checked out because there's more to it than just cancer or not cancer. Uh, some of the things that we look for, uh, and this is where I would start with, is be familiar with your breasts. We no longer recommend uh, doing monthly self-exams because what happens is everyone freaks out. And by the way, I do too. So I'm not any different. But, uh, but breast self-awareness instead. So when you get out of the shower every day, take a look in that mirror. Feel your breath, train your eyes to what's normal for your body, because then one day when you notice a difference, you can address it with someone before it becomes something serious. So what the hallmark signs of a cancerous breast lump, things that I look for are skin dimpling over the mask um, or, you know, what looks like an orange peel appearance. It just looks like little dimples all over the place. Um, I'm more suspicious of a mask that's not painful 
then I am with a mask that, that is painful. Most of the time, if a mask is painful, I can breathe a sigh of relief. This probably isn't cancer. It's probably a benign breast mask. And the most common type is called a fibroadenoma. And these are totally benign breast masks. They don't ever become cancer. They don't increase your risk of cancer. They're just a pain in the ass. And millions of women have them. They typically show up in the teens and early 20s and 30s. They're hormonally driven. They commonly get bigger with your cycle and then smaller and then bigger and then cycle smaller. And they're rubbery feeling. But in the end, a clinical exam, even by me, your surgeon, is not going to tell me what this is. So we'll want to do some imaging. We may want to do a biopsy. And depending on what kind of patient you are, whether you're 15 or you're 45, then the judgment call becomes a little bit different because we're more suspicious of cancer in someone who's 60 than we are of someone who's 15. So we kind of use all that criteria. We look at family history. We look at all the other risk factors. Um, and one of the things that uh, people ask for me is, you know, if the lump is mobile, meaning it moves on your chest rather than stuck to your chest, should you assume that it's okay? And I would say no. It should get checked out, even if it's probably a benign breast mass, it should get checked out so that you know what your options are. And if a biopsy needs to be performed, then you know that you have that done. And biopsy, by the way, when we say biopsy, what we mean is a needle biopsy, which is done in the office with a little bit of lidocaine to numb up the area. No one should ever be taking out these masses in the operating room without knowing what it is first, because you never want to have a surprise on the operating room table. Uh, there are other masses uh, that can happen beyond cancer, uh, which uh, there's cirrhosing adenosis, there's um, you know, fibrocystic disease, there's also just simple cysts that can show up and disappear. These are all hormonally driven. And these are the reasons that you want to have that evaluated by your breast surgeon so that you don't assume something. Because, of course, breast cancer, if it happens to be breast cancer, it's not difficult to treat, and it has a, an amazing survival rate if it's caught early. So the earlier we catch it, the better. But the best thing that you can do for yourself beyond breast awareness is starting at age 40, get that mammogram once a year. And we'll talk about breast surveillance uh, in the next segment. Uh, things that grow quickly tend more often to be benign stuff. And it is scary, but that's why your, your doctor should be a partner in all of that. I mean, I remember, I want to say five, six years ago, I was taking a shower and all of a sudden, you know, I'm just, whatever, I'm using soap. And all of a sudden I feel this thing and it's like a, I felt like it was a piece of gravel under my skin. And I was like, what is right. this? And I freaked out. It was really scary. Yeah. And I was like, this is, you know. And I had a moment, I was like, this can't be. And it was like you were talking about before, you know, this notion of the breast tissue extends so far into, you know, into your, under your armpit, into like this axillary area. I was yes. like, this is so bizarre. So at first I was like, I think I'm feeling things. You know, I went through the whole denial and said, and, you know, fast forward, ended up with a needle biopsy and, you know, it turned out mm -hmm. to be a lymph node that was um, inflamed and it was fine. But I will say super it, was, an, super it was very anxiety inducing, right? Because it is Absolutely. such a foreign feeling where you feel something that is so um, hard and unlike what the rest of your body feels like. And it's a very disempowering and, you know, you're feeling. Right. It is, it is anxiety-inducing, but, but the important thing to remember is the story you just told, that's a success story. That's a job well done because you were on top of it. You were feeling your body, being aware. You noticed the change. You went in. You got it evaluated. You probably had some imaging done. They did a biopsy because they thought, you know what, there's enough here to make sure that we, sh we should rule out anything more suspicious, and it came back benign, and that is a job well done. That's exactly how it's supposed to work. And that's the value of making you making sure you bring it up to your doctor so that it can be taken care of while it's still very small. Yeah. And, you know, now I do like what, you know, these screening ultrasounds and every time I go, they say, oh, look, there it is. And it's not changed. And OK, moving on. Right. And I think it's important right. that Absolutely. people remember that if you feel something funky, that's different, whatever it's a lot better to go check it out than to be so scared of what the result may show that you, yeah. you know, 
kind of put it somewhere in the back of your brain and move along because what ends up happening is if you are within that scary 10% who unfortunately are not going to have the good result, waiting mm-hmm. is not good, right? You don't want to wait right. on something. And, and I'll, I'll also add that there are benign breast diseases that do increase risk of cancer. And even though it's not cancer, there are some things you might want to do about that. And that might include a lumpectomy just to make sure there's nothing else suspicious. That might include taking some medication. That might include increased surveillance with clinical breast exams and and whatever else is appropriate. And so we want to make sure that we're on top of it, that we're ahead of the eight ball, that we're uh, putting the patient in a place of empowerment so that she is in charge because that's what it's all about. You should be in charge of your body and your doctor should be your partner in this. Now, along those same lines, I, you know, if we're going to go with me as another great case example, I also remember probably with my second, I, I had stopped breastfeeding about a year before. And one day I get out of the shower and all of a sudden I'm like, I think I'm lactating. What is going on? Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm like, excuse me, this is not meant to happen. Yeah, and I remember being like, thing. You know, and now I know that. And in fact, of course, now that I know it, I've had so many patients who have the same complaint and I can pretty comfortably be like, okay, it's not so uncommon. But at the time, I remember being pretty freaked out. Can you speak to how someone can know whether breast discharge is normal versus not? You know, what are hallmarks of normal breast discharge versus atypical? So the, the, most, the most common types of breast discharge are what we call physiologic. They're just normal nipple discharges. Um, and that's stuff that comes out of your breast uh, in nipple, and oftentimes it's clear, maybe a little yellowish or greenish. Sometimes it's milky. And this is all benign. That is benign. Uh, and there's not a whole lot that we do for that. Oftentimes, here's what happens. Somebody notices a tiny drop, maybe it's in the shower, something like that, and then they squeeze it because they say, hey, what's that? Then they squeeze it, and then more comes out. Then, okay, they didn't do anything about it. They didn't talk to anybody. They didn't say anything. The next day, they're like, I wonder if it's still there. They squeeze it again, and then they squeeze it again, and then they <laughs> squeeze it again. And by the way, your partner is very helpful because when you go to have sex, they're touching your nipples too. So now that's even more stimulation. So the doctor comes, you finally go to see the doctor because you've scared the crap out of yourself. And oftentimes my answer is stop touching it. Stop playing with it. Tell your partner to stop playing with it. Right. Because it's just physiologic. Now, when more concerned about nipple discharge, if it's coming from one specific duct, and, and you can take a look, because remember you have multiple duct openings at the tip of your nipple, Um, And more specifically, if it's bloody or if it's an association with a breast mass, especially if it doesn't hurt, these are more suspicious findings. And at this point, the next step would be a breast exam with your breast surgeon. And before you go into that office, make sure you go and get that imaging, get that mammogram and ultrasound that they can take a look and see what's going on. Because many times it's just a dilated duct and maybe there is some debris stuck in there, and it's just backed up. Remember, this is a tubing system. It's a plumbing system. So it can get backed up, and you get a little bit of overflow, and every time you go pinching it, well, now you're stimulating it. Because remember, when you're not lactating, those nipple ducts are plugged, and the plugs come out when you go to lactate. So if the plug is staying out and you keep touching it, well, then it's never going to reform and you're, you're always going to have this discharge. So the most suspicious one for me is a bloody nipple discharge. Now, even in that case, the most common cause of a bloody nipple discharge is a benign condition called an intraductal papilloma. It's just a little growth inside the duct, and it waves in the breeze, and sometimes it bleeds, and then that's it. That's 50% of the time. But we do want to rule out cancer, so that's why you want to go and see your breast surgeon and let them do the workup and then figure out what the next steps are. And who typically, who should a woman see for, for example, like the mammogram, et cetera, would an OBGYN be the most appropriate person to do that initial workup? Yeah, the initial workup can be done by either your OBGYN or your primary care doctor, family practice, or internal medicine. And that person should be doing a breast exam for you once a year. If they're not doing it, ask for it. If they still won't do it, change doctors. 
That's that's an important message, right? Um, because they should be very comfortable doing it, right? That's their job. They should be very um, comfortable doing it. There is um, a controversy on the subject of breast examination in the office because there was a study that showed that breast examination by the doctor didn't improve a detection of cancer. But the trouble is that many times the doctor documents a breast exam and didn't actually do it. So you want someone who actually is going to do it for you. Well, that's disheartening, frankly, but we'll move on. We are going to take a brief break. You're listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center, and after the break, we are going to talk more with Dr. Sangeeta Kolari about breast pain, lumps, and more, and about imaging. Don't go away. More to come. Attorney Renee Marie Smith is changing the way we sell real estate. She wrote a series of books called My Short Sale Guru Guides for all real estate practitioners. Whether you're a homeowner wanting to understand the process, an agent who has been handling short sales for years, or an industry analyst wanting to know how short sales impact your business, Renee uses her vast real estate experience to take a comprehensive look at the recent market phenomena while relaying it in an easy-to-understand format. Through her company, Smith Title Services, Renee has counseled thousands of short sale participants and processed in excess of a thousand short sales. Her knowledge is transformational for real estate professionals and laymen alike, and her live presentations provide people the opportunity to ask specific questions about their issues. Buy her books and schedule her to speak at your next event. Visit www.smithtitleservices.com or call 305-705-3428 or email her at renee at smithtitleservices.com. Isn't it time to sell your property today? Learn the My Short Sale Guru way. Essential Nutrients, LLC, is the brainchild of entrepreneur Barbara Burns. Inspired by a desire to help others, Barbara worked with a team of scientists to develop unique nutritional liquid supplements with the goal to improve the quality of your life. Glucosamine, zinc, and calcium are essential to well-being, and this is the focus of Essential Nutrients, LLC. Whether you're a professional athlete, weekend warrior, student, business owner, or homemaker, Essential Nutrients offers products for everyone, including the family pet. And they're easy to take, no pills. Health requires commitment, exercise, a good diet, proper supplementation, and action. So take action today and get your supply of Essential Liquid Nutrients by visiting www.essential-liquids.com. Don't put off your health any longer. Take Essential products today and start to measure the difference. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and we are talking to Dr. Sangeeta Kalari about everything about the breast, right? Pain, lumps, bumps. And don't forget, you can give us a call, 866-451-1451. And so we've talked, we've kind of been dabbling and mentioned mammograms, ultrasound. We kind of talked about imaging. We just haven't talked about imaging, so to speak. So let's discuss imaging. What, you know, you mentioned age 40, for routine breast imaging. Yes. You know, I think that um, historically this has kind of gone back and forth, right? This is not, there have been times where they've had different ages and different recommendations. And can you speak to the controversy and when women really should be starting having surveillance of to kind of maximize their breast health? Absolutely. So basically, historically, we were recommending every year starting at age 40, and you would start earlier if you had, you know, risk factors, um, and you would do it every year. Then what happened was, remember, the history of breast cancer is for a long time, we were only diagnosing breast cancer when patients walked in the door with a mass that they could feel. And oftentimes that was an advanced breast cancer. With the advent of mammography, we were catching these, these cancers earlier and earlier and earlier, and survival was getting better and better and better. And there is an entity called non-invasive breast cancer. It's called DCIS. And this is a breast cancer. It is a cancer, but it doesn't have the ability to travel because it hasn't evolved to that stage yet. Remember, cancer is like an evolving beast. And as time progresses, it gets worse and worse because it accrues more and more mutations that enable it to do more and more damage in your body. So as mammograms got better and better, and now all mammograms are digital, we were catching more and more of these non-invasive breast cancers. And they don't kill you because they don't have that ability to travel. But if less 
to their own devices, eventually they, some of them will become an invasive breast cancer. So this question arose of, well, we're cutting out these breast cancers and catching them early and submitting people to all these treatments, but are we necessarily affecting survival in doing so? And they did a study and they said, no, we're not affecting survival by doing this. But the problem is, that when you excise this non-invasive breast cancer, that represents an invasive cancer that has been prevented. That's what that, rep that's what that is. It also represents a patient who, because they never had to have invasive breast cancer, they never had to have chemo. That's a big win for a patient yeah, to not have to have that's chemo. Because of course, women are terrified of that. So, and that, but don't forget, that comes with a lot of complications on its own. So DCIS is a job well done by the radiologist and the surgeon who caught this cancer before it could cause a lot of trouble. And the recommendation then became from a couple of different organizations that we should start at age 50 instead of age 40, and we should do it every two years, and then stop it at age 75. Now, the problem is that the recommendation has come, this recommendation has come from a couple of different groups. U.S. Preventive Task Force Service is one of them. American Cancer Society is another. Here's the problem. Those societies do not write the guidelines for surgeons. They don't write the guidelines for radiologists. American Cancer Society is not a society of doctors. They don't do studies. They don't make recommendations. If I get sued in a lawsuit, I cannot quote the American Cancer Society's recommendation. Because that's oh. not the industry standard. As a breast surgeon, the industry standard for me is set by the American Society of Breast Surgeons. For a radiologist, it's set by the American College of Radiology. And we, both organizations, feel that this data, this recommendation of starting at age 50 and only doing it every two years is going to miss a lot of cancers. And that's a lot of anxiety for patients. On top of which, their recommendation is based on patients being, quote unquote, of average risk. But risk is not something that you can just say, well, you're high risk and you're low risk. Risk is something that actually has to be calculated. There is a formal risk assessment that can be done by your breast surgeon or your genetics counselor if you happen to have one because you have a bad family history. There's a formal risk assessment. There's a percentage number attached to that. And if you have a lifetime percentage risk of 20% or higher, based on this calculation, there are very specific recommendations of not just mammograms, but also clinical breast exam every six months, adding a breast MRI every year because you are of that kind of high risk situation, and also consideration of a medication to decrease your risk of cancer by 50%. But for all of that to happen, an actual risk calculation has to be made. And the problem with those recommendations is most doctors in your primary care setting, in your OBGYN setting, they don't have the time to do a formal risk assessment because that's an hour-long discussion. Right. I do a separate consultation with my patients just talking about risk for breast cancer because many times they meet criteria for genetic testing, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a lot to that. So it's not reasonable to expect that of any primary care doctor. So in the, re in the meantime, the problem is a lot of patients, by that recommendation, are going to slip through the cracks and have a more advanced cancer than they needed to because screening didn't happen until, earlier, uh, until later in the game. So our recommendation, the American Society of Breast Cancer, as, uh, sorry, the American, yeah, American Society of Breast Surgeons, as well as the American College of Radiology, is to start at age 40, and do it every year. And we do not recommend arbitrarily stopping at age 75 because let's face it, we all know that grandma who at 90. Mine, my grandma at 88 and she's everywhere. fine. Oh yeah. I have a roster of 79 year old patients. In fact, I have one who up until last year was literally sailing around the world with her 83 year old husband. Yeah, my grandma had a long birthday. Yeah, she's awesome. She just turned 90. Yes. Done. So we recommend that if that we recommend that for a patient, if she's in good health and she's doing great and she's you know she's not bedridden, she's not suffering from a number of other medical problems, that she should continue getting her manograms it, because if she has ten years of quality life left minimum, then she has something to lose if a breast cancer goes undiagnosed. She has something to lose. That makes a lot of sense. Now, how about, let's say we have a listening, we have like a 35-year-old woman 
who says, you know, my mom had cancer when she was 40, but none of my doctors have brought it up. Should, what right. should, should she be so, proactive? Like how, sh- when should yes. she be proactive? So in her case, the, the recommendation is that if you have a family history of breast cancer, and by that I mean a first degree relative like mom or a sister, a second degree relative like, you know, like an aunt or a grandmother uh, or a third degree like a cousin or, you know, any of like those categories, um, look at their age at diagnosis of breast cancer and subtract 10. So in this case that you gave, mom was diagnosed at age 40, subtract 10. This patient should start her yearly mammograms at age 30. Now, if mom had been 60 when she was diagnosed with breast cancer, then subtract 10, that's 50. Well, where are you going to start her mammograms at 40 anyway? Mm-hmm. So it's whichever date comes sooner. If it's 10 years minus the relative's age, start then. If it's age 40, start then, whichever one comes sooner. And that person should have consideration to have a risk assessment to see what are the other risk factors that may be contributing because she might meet criteria for genetic testing. And I'll bring up an important point here. When you look at family history, don't just look at mom's side, look at dad's side. Right, because everyone forgets about dad. uh, Absolutely. Dad's side can have a history of breast cancer and that can be contributory. I have many patients who inherited a mutation from dad's side. And don't forget, even if it's not a breast cancer history, there are other cancer histories in the family on both sides that can increase your risk of breast cancer. So, for example, if you have a lot of colon cancers in the family, there can be a mutation that increases your risk of colon cancer, which happens to also increase your risk of breast cancer. Yeah. And so genetic testing will tell you. So helpful here. And who's the best person to do that? Your internist? I mean, you said they're not going to sit there and do it with you. But if you actually say set up a special time, presumably, would that be the first line person? The best thing to do would be to, if if you're concerned about your risk for breast cancer, the best thing to do would be to talk to your primary care doctor about referring you to see a breast surgeon to have a formal risk assessment, because then they cannot just look at your family history but also look at all your other contributing factors, like being overweight as a risk factor, having had a biopsy that shows a particular finding, that also increases your risk of breast cancer. And these are all things that the breast surgeon will put into their calculator to give an actual number. Because remember, we all have to get our mammograms and everything through insurance. We have to justify to them while we're doing all this extra work. So having that documentation really helps to get insurance to pay for these things. How about lifestyle choices like smoking cigarettes how does that impact well i I know of no study that tells you that smoking is helpful for any aspect of your health (laughs) so absolutely it does increase your risk of breast cancer and uh, it is a standard thing that when someone is diagnosed uh with breast cancer they must quit smoking because you're going to be looking at surgery and you want to heal well um and i absolutely that's one of the best things you can do to reduce your risk of breast cancer is to quit smoking Um, Other things that you can do is just maintaining a healthy weight, staying active. There's a lot of data um, that we're looking at more and more um, because one of the things that increases risk of breast cancer is having uh, uh, sort of a higher estrogen level or higher estrogen exposure in your body. Now, some things contribute to that that you cannot help. For example, how old you were when you had your period for the first time. How old you were when you went through menopause? You can't change those things. How old you were when you had your first children? You can't go back in time and change those things. You can't go back in time and change the family history either. But one of the things that we know is that fat converts some of the steroids that circulate in your body into estrogen. So if you are very overweight, that's a higher amount of estrogen circulating in your body, and that does increase the risk of breast cancer. So start walking. If you have a dog, take that dog for a walk a couple times a day. Start eating healthy. Start focusing on your global health. Yeah. You know, it's amazing how much all goes back to being healthy. We have to take another brief break. You're listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and we are talking about breast health really stay tuned do you know if you're high risk well we're going to find out what defines high risk stay with us 
Are you stressed? Is your stress driving you crazy? Do you know there are many ways to relieve this stress? The Spirit Within Massage and Hypnosis Clinic does just that. Reduce your stress plus so much more. Established in 1997, the Spirit Within Massage and Hypnosis Clinic offers an approach to wellness for those individuals who choose to either utilize appropriate complementary methods to enhance their current medical care or to those individuals who are on their personal journey toward improved health and wellness through the use of therapeutic bodywork, Reiki energy healing, or hypnosis. The Spirit Within Massage and Hypnosis Clinic is owned by Dr. Judy Dean, a registered nurse and board-certified massage therapist and medical hypnotherapist in LaPorte, Indiana. Visit www.spiritwithinmassage-hypnosis.com to see all services offered by Dr. Judy. For a free personal consultation, please call Dr. Judy Dean at 219-326-1380. The Spirit Within Massage and Hypnosis Clinic, 219-326-1380. Intergenerational programming is uniting America due to the tireless efforts of Dr. Ramona Frischman. Retired from the Miami-Dade County Public School System, Dr. Frischman continues to develop intergenerational learning programs aimed to improve the lives of children, young adults, and seniors through unique strategies and public policy in order to establish a mutually supportive agenda. She views intergenerational programs as a resource for policymakers and the general public on economic, social, and personal initiatives that govern our society. Her work bridges the generational gap, providing many individuals the opportunity to explore areas of common ground and celebrate each other's diversity. Contact Ramona Frischman at RamonaLong at AOL.com or visit www.gu.org to learn more about intergenerational programming. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and we are speaking to Dr. Sangeeta Kulori, and she is awesome. I, I am so excited about this show, and I'm excited. I'm going to plug it now, and I'll plug it later, that she's coming back in a few months. I'm going to get the exact date because everyone should listen because I'm obsessed. Seriously. Now, <laughs> screening ultrasound. What is it? Is Ah, it beneficial? Why? Why not? It is not something that is recommended. Uh, So basically where this came from is uh, a number of states passed laws because there's a lot of awareness right now about patients who have dense breasts. And why we care about that is that if you have dense breasts, a mammogram may not pick up a cancer if it happens to be there because it's just hard to see. And generally speaking, mammograms pick up about 85% of breast cancers, which is pretty darn good in my opinion. Um, But if you happen to have dense breasts, then the diagnostic accuracy of that test does go down. So because there were patients whose cancers were missed, there was a demand, oh, well, we should have a screening ultrasound. And a lot of states passed laws saying this must be offered. However, this is not validated by any studies. Screening ultrasound does not pick up things at any higher rate. Uh, Because remember, an ultrasound is technician dependent. It's it's a wonderful test. It's a go-to, my favorite test in the world. If there's actually something for me to look at, like if I felt something on a patient or she felt something or the mammogram showed something and we want more information about that mass, absolutely, I will pick up my ultrasound right away in the office and take a look. But on a patient, who has an otherwise normal mammogram, that screening ultrasound is not a real thing, and it should not be used. So unfortunately, a lot of patients are being kind of pressured into that, and then they're, well, they're scared because they don't want to miss something. Then they submit to this test, and, and it's oftentimes not even covered by insurance because it's not a real test. So if someone's offering you a screening ultrasound, be careful about that. You'll be better off just doing your yearly mammogram and making sure that you get into the regular doctor's office and have that breast exam, and then that you'll be breast aware um, and, and do, you know, and just sort of visually check yourself and with your hands just be familiar with your breast. Uh, now, a lot of patients ask me about breast MRIs as well, because, of course, MRI is, oh, it's a great test. It gives you a lot of information. MRIs are very much a double-edged sword. It is a wonderful test for the, for the right patient. Now, the problem with an MRI is if the MRI is negative, 
That's 97% accurate. That's amazing. So if you, if, if I do an MRI for you, Dr. Snyder, and it doesn't show me anything, I can go to you and say, I'm 97% sure there really is nothing there. That's great. But let's say it shows me something. The accuracy falls to something like 56%. So many times, the MRI is lighting up like a Christmas tree, and there is nothing there. <laughs> and now you're on what we call the diagnostic roller coaster. Now you have to do this big workup, and there's nothing there. And there's a lot of fear. Now you, by the way, post the needle, the, the breast of the giant needle, which causes trauma, which changes the appearance of the mammogram. And by the way, scars can look like cancer on a mammogram too. So you really didn't help yourself there by getting a, bio, a biopsy and getting all this extra workup. So MRIs are typically recommended for patients who are of high risk with that greater than 20% lifetime risk of breast cancer, which is calculated. And then we do it once a year because in that patient, because she is so high risk for breast cancer, we know we're willing to take the risk that in case that, mam that MRI lights up, we're willing to go down that road because we already know that she's of high risk. But in an average risk patient, odds are it will light up and there's nothing there. And now you just created a lot of trouble for yourself. So I don't recommend MRIs routinely. And in fact, they're not even recommended routinely for patients diagnosed with breast cancer. And that is the American Society of Breast Surgeons position on the matter. Wow. So not even right, I guess, because if you have, you know, a false positive, it doesn't really tell you much. I mean, that's oh, that's pretty. And then what happens is it scares you into a mastectomy. Oh. And now you did a big surgery with an increased risk of complications, and you didn't need to. And nothing hurts my heart more than when I go to my breast conference every week where we discuss cases, and some surgeon had a, a one-centimeter breast cancer, did an MRI. The MRI lit up like a Christmas tree. The patient gets scared, chooses a mastectomy, and guess what? On final specimen, the cancer was one centimeter. And now she has a complication. Oh. And this is not, you know, not not a pie in the sky situation. It's quite common. Oh. And what do you say to that patient? I mean, that you know, it's like well, there's really I, I no. I don't like to guilt people after the fact because once once you've made a surgical decision, you can't really right. go back on that. But uh, for my patients that come in and as part of the risk assessment, we talk about when it's appropriate to do an MRI and when not, and what it, what it can do for us and what it can't. And my basic guideline for myself as a doctor is if I'm going to order a test, I better be getting something for my money. Because yeah. if ordering that test isn't going to change what I recommend, there's no point in doing it. I agree with you 100%. Now, I think one thing I would love to quickly touch on is we've kind of said high risk several times. And we mentioned family sure. history, genetics, obviously, mm -hmm. right? So family history. Um, being overweight, smoking, um, are there any other, right, so history of some lump, are there any other things that we, that women should kind of be aware of? We, you mentioned um, age of your first period and age when you had your first child. Is it better to be older or younger in that, in that group? Uh, so, so what we're talking about here is estrogen exposure in, your, in the course of your life. So start talking to talk about when you started your period. If I have two twins, and they're identical twins, and one of them has a period at age eight, and the other one had a period at age 15, the eight-year-old had seven more years of estrogen exposure because she was having a period for seven more years longer. That puts her at a higher risk for breast cancer than her twins. And equally, if you take these same two twins and one had menopause at age 45 and the other one had menopause at age 55, the 55-year-old is at a higher risk for breast cancer because she had 10 more years of still having her period. Now, you really can't control that. That's just biology. So it's just something to be aware of. Um, now, having children late in life does not increase your risk of breast cancer. It's more the opposite, which is, if you've had your children prior to the age of 
25 or 30, that actually does decrease your risk of breast cancer. Now, I'm 34 and I just had my very first child, so I'm not going to like go out and stress myself on, you know, what my risk of breast cancer is going to be because, of course, you know, you have your kids and you have your kids. But that's something that we put in the calculator. Breastfeeding actually does decrease risk of breast cancer. Um, because that's, uh, pregnancy and lactation are times where your estrogen levels are a little bit different because you're less likely to get pregnant because you're supporting a baby. Uh, and your body knows that, so it's, it kind of alters your risk factor, which is, which is nice to know. Um, again, we talked about weight and uh, just being of overall good health. We talked about smoking, of course. Um, other factors are if you've had a breast biopsy in the past, and especially if that breast biopsy shows something called atypical ductal hyperplasia, atypical lobular hyperplasia, these lesions do increase your risk of breast cancer substantially. And if you've had either of those, ADH or ALH, on a needle biopsy, you do need to have that excised with a lumpectomy just to make sure that there's nothing else suspicious in that area. And if that biopsy didn't show anything else, fabulous, but now you're in the high-risk category, and we talk about some of the measures. Um, we talked about family history, not just with breast cancer, but also ovarian cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer. These are the big hitters. So we care about all those because they do increase risk of breast cancer because some families do have mutations that are being inherited that might be causing the cancer in the family. Well, such amazing information. Thank you, Dr. Sangeeta Kalori. And you are coming back on Valentine's Day, so everyone should tune in and also tune in next Wednesday and every Wednesday at 1 p.m. And thank you to our listeners for listening today. Um, this has been such a great show. I have really enjoyed it. I hope you have Two, um, this has been an episode of MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. Until next time, be well, enjoy life, and thanks for listening. You've been listening to MD for Moms with your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. Please join us each and every week for answers to the many challenging issues moms face today on the next episode of Dr. Carly's MD for Moms. been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.